Welcome to The Metabolic Link, a podcast that explores the common thread of metabolism in health and disease. This is where science meets society. Welcome back to another episode of The Metabolic Link. I'm super excited to share this interview with you today. Uh, today, uh, I interviewed Francisca Spritzler. She is a registered dietitian uh, with a specialization in ketogenic diets and also low-carb diets. And we had a wonderful com conversation. We hit on so many topics, including the essential tools that she uses for uh, helping people adhere to low carb diets. We talk about blood work. We talk about uh, navigating low carb and ketogenic diets during travel and when you go out to eat. Uh, we hit on non nutritive sweeteners. We talked about allulose and how her opinions on these things and if they should or shouldn't be incorporated into the diet. Uh, nutrient testing, blood work, all these different things. So Francisca is a registered dietitian. She is also certified in uh, diabetes uh, education. She's an author and she utilizes low carb approach for diabetes, weight management, and overall health uh, for her clients. And she was an early adopter of this approach. And I got into this, you know, like 15 years ago and and she was, and she was one of the first dietitians that I came across. She was an attendee of one of the first metabolic health summits back in uh, 2016. She lives in South Florida now, and she's been following low carb uh, for well over a decade. Uh, she is a former freelance writer. Her articles have appeared on many websites, many news outlets, uh, diabetes journals and magazines. And uh, I'm very excited for you to listen to this interview today. Thank you for tuning in. Metabolic Health Summit is the world's premier scientific and medical conference on metabolic health and therapies, featuring world-renowned expert speakers, cutting-edge science, an innovative expo, and incredible networking opportunities. MHS is altogether an unforgettable experience for anyone interested in metabolic health. I think Metabolic Health Summit is amazing. It does such a phenomenal job of bringing world-renowned experts in different illnesses and metabolism, real-world experiences, clinicians, patients, paired with vendors who are trying to make this easier for people. You know, I think for everybody who comes, including myself, learn something. Join us January 25th to 28th, 2024 in Clearwater Beach, Florida, or attend virtually. CMEs are available. Go to metabolichealthsummit.com to register. So welcome, Francisca. Thank you so much for doing this interview. And I thought we'd start off, uh, maybe you could give our listeners here uh, a little bit of a background on how you got into this career path from a registered, you know, being a registered dietitian. And I went through a dietetics program and I think we talked very little about ketogenic diets or even low carb diets. And, uh, and I also heard, I think you on another podcast where, uh, I think you had a background working at the VA hospital too. So, uh, so I'd like to hear a little bit about your background and how you got steered into this direction, into the low carb space. Great. Well, thank you for that introduction, Dom. And yes, I've been a dietitian since 2008, and I started working at the VA healthcare system in Long Beach, California, first in spinal cord injury inpatient for several years, and then as a diabetes educator. And I was following traditional uh, guidance in terms of eating kind of low fat diet. I wasn't into low carb or keto or anything when I became a dietitian. But in 2011, I had some lab work done and I had an A1C done for the first time in my life. And it came back at 5.6%, which concerned me because my fasting blood sugar was about 80. And I thought, how could my A1C be very, very near to a prediabetes diagnosis? So I started testing my blood sugar after meals and discovered that although it was 80 fasting, it would go up into the 150s, 160s, even higher sometimes with a moderate amount of carbs, not even a lot. So I started doing a little research and uh, about carbohydrate restriction for people with diabetes and prediabetes, started cutting back carbs and realized it made a huge difference. And that made me question what I had been telling my patients at the VA when I gave diabetes classes or did one-on-one -on -one counseling. 
Um, and unfortunately, ketogenic and low-carb diets really weren't accepted. This was back in 2000, early 2011. And nobody at the VA was really interested in my experiments <laughs> that I was doing on myself. And they thought the patients really wouldn't want to do it. And these were a lot of patients um, that were on like industrial strength insulin doses with type 2 diabetes at meals. So the doctor's main concern was that the patients wouldn't go low. So they were recommending, you know, high carbohydrate meals and snacks before bed. And uh, the more I did the research, I realized this is absolutely wrong. We should be taking insulin doses down and giving less carbohydrates so that people um, can actually have good glycemic control and don't have to worry about those lows because they're not taking such high insulin doses. So I left the VA at the end of 2013 to go out and start on my own in private practice with an exclusive low carb approach. And uh, I've never looked back. And that's how I got into doing what I do. Mm -hmm. Did you find it difficult to make that jump from working as an employer to more or less working on your own and carving a career path uh, as you know, uh, an entrepreneur and a and a consultant, kind of in this space, and I, I think I was familiar with you too. And maybe this dates back to the early di Diet Doctor. Uh, you were uh, worked with Diet Doctor, right, to create some of the articles and things like that. I think that's how I might have yeah. came across you. Uh, and did you find it difficult to make that jump, or the community was kind of um, up and running around maybe 2014 and 15, it was gaining some steam. So, and you were just like an, I consider you like one of the first early adopters to kind of jumping ship, if you will, <laughs> uh, from the registered dietitian space and into the low carb because you saw a clear vision. And I, and I assume that you just wanted to help more people because you just had this knowledge that was really not being accepted by the VA system. And I can understand the VA system being giving some pushback there. So I would just, I would be curious uh, because I do have a lot of students that see what you do. They're familiar with uh, your work and your, your education outreach, and they would kind of, they're inspired. You have inspired them to go down like a similar path in their education training. So I'm just curious of your, how, if you face any resistance and, and how you uniquely carved uh, your career path. Yeah, thanks. That's a great question. It, um, you know, I felt like I had to leave because I couldn't give the guidance I was giving anymore, but I was a little scared to go out on my own. Um, because again, this was, you know, by the time I started, it was January 2014 that I was doing, um, work all on my own, kind of reaching out to doctors, seeing if they would send anybody to me, um, you know, looking for some integrative doctors. There were no low carb doctors that I knew of in my area. And at the time I was doing um, not really remote work. I was actually meeting with people in person and started like open my own office, but it was definitely different than the VA where everything's very regulated. There's lots of doctors looking over your work, you know, good manager. I was doing all of that myself. And uh, I did try to connect with a few uh, dietitians that were doing low carb work, but there weren't a lot of us. And now it, the field has grown so much and it makes me so happy. I would get, you know, I still continue to get a lot of emails from dietitians. It's grown so much over the years, but ketogenic diets didn't really become that popular, um, you know, in the lay public, I would say until I, maybe 2015, 2016 is when it really started taking off. So I had that good year or two to try to figure things out on my own. And I was doing a blog and the Chris Gunners from Authority Nutrition, I don't know if you remember oh, yeah. him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. but, yeah. So he reached out to me, liked the work I was doing on my blog, and I started writing for him for a long time until uh, they got bought out by Healthline. And then I started writing at Diet Doctor. And then they offered me to come actually full time uh, starting in 2019 from up until just recently. I was writing for Diet Doctor full time. Um, so, uh, yes, I've, I've done both. I've done the counseling and clinical work. And then I've also done writing in the low carb and ketogenic space. Okay. And uh, it's been a good blend. Um, and as I said, I'm just so happy that there are many other dietitians, diabetes educators, nurses that have come into the space since I started. Yeah. So how would you describe kind of what you do now? Are you, uh, do you have like, are you working virtually with patients or are you really focused on 
sort of uh, amplifying your message just through outreach, through the blog. I was listening to, I was watching some of your uh, YouTube videos today, which uh, people listening, definitely check out your YouTube page. You have some fantastic, you know, advice on just like food I was watching and you have a very uh, beautiful images of food and you, you talk through different recipes and things like that. It's very appealing to people like, for example, my parents, or if you're new to low carb and if you think it's restrictive, <laughs> I can, you walk people through uh, food options that they could have that many people would otherwise think would not be an option on, on low carb or, or ketogenic diets. Uh, so maybe describe kind of what you do. Are you still working with patients? Are you, or just trying to amplify your message through outreach education or both? Yeah, actually a bit of both. Oh. Um, when I left diet doctor, I wasn't hundred percent sure what I was going to do. I had done some YouTube videos, I actually put a pause on that because I'm busy with other things, but I loved doing them. And thank you so much for that nice feedback. Um, and I do try to keep them really simple. They're very basic. Mm -hmm. And uh, they don't go too much into the science, but, you know, they're evidence based. The content yep. is. And so I'm doing that. But I also do have some uh, clients that I see. And I'm not really taking too many new clients right now because I'm also doing some work uh, at the company uh, where one of my former co co-workers at Diet Doctor, Dr. Brett Scher, is working for Metabolic Mind. Oh, I'm yeah. writing um, some blog articles for them. I don't think any of them have been published, but I've written a few. And also for the Institute for Personalized Therapeutic Nutrition, which is a Canadian nonprofit organization, I'm helping them with some of their pre-diabetes content and uh, and some other work. So I'm I'm kind of busy doing a bunch of different things, and also uh, I do enjoy seeing clients. I have a few patients and clients that I worked with years ago who wanted when they heard I was opening up my practice again, wanted to come back and start working with me, which was really nice. Mm -hmm. So I have a, a nice great. mix. Yeah. Nice blend. And that's great to hear you're working for Metabolic Mind. So I've been connected with Jen Bazuki and that group for quite some time. And they're doing big plug to them. They're doing incredible work spearheading metabolic psychiatry and advancing the science and the application and the education outreach uh, through what you're doing, which is so important, you know, because uh, you know, in the world of science, you there's top a lot of the top tier researchers just stay in their their little corner or their lane, and they work really hard. They you know funded by the NIH, publish high impact peer reviewed articles, but the science doesn't permeate into the public really, and uh, you're not going to cure. <laughs> metabolic syndrome and you're not going to help people uh with high impact peer review publications the science is great but it tends as a scientist it's just everything r moves so incrementally slow and you can have a whole career doing great science but a lot of it just is not getting out there uh and, and helping people so uh the bazucki brain research fund that really focuses on like high level science basic science, clinical science, and they bring people on like you who are at the top tier of understanding the science and actually putting it into uh, being able to translate the science into actionable uh, things through, through diet and diet formulations and the implementation, which as a scientist, after working several years on this and seeing the effects in the lab, you know, over time, we realized that it's really the impl implementation of this approach and the acceptance is what's going to be needed to make an impact, a public health impact. And it's so important. It took me a while to realize that, but, um, but it's definitely so important. Uh, when it comes to people that you work with just on an individual basis, it sounds like, uh, who would like, what, what characteristics do you focus on in treating? Is it weight loss? And do you, one question I had, have you worked with kids at all? Kids with epilepsy or autism? And I was just curious about that. Yeah, um, most of my clients either want to lose weight or they have diabetes or polycystic ovarian syndrome or something um, that a low carb or ketogenic diet will be helpful for. And uh, primarily adults. I haven't worked with kids too much. However, a few years ago, I did work with Max Love Foundation with some of the kids with cancer. And I was going to say, uh, as far as ke uh, ketone levels, I haven't worked with a lot of people who need to have very high ketone levels, with the exception of that group. The children with brain cancer, they actually do want to have their ketones at a, a certain level, like above two. And uh, so that was a different, um, you know, I, I usually don't focus too much on getting the ketones up. 
and with children I had to. And, yeah. um, but that was a wonderful experience. And that was, as I said, a few years ago. Um, but mainly my work is with adults who, uh, you know, I would say mostly pre-diabetes, diabetes, or weight loss is the primary groups that I work with. Yeah. And, you know, uh, and, and, you know, the audience, m- many people listening may be confused about low carb <laughs> and internet keto, if you want to use that term and like the clinical ketogenic diet. And I think we can make the statement, uh, we study clinical ketogenic diets. We also, uh, investigate the application of ketone supplements in the form of ketone esters and various ketone salt formulations uh, to circumvent the dietary restriction that's typically associated with getting into therapeutic ketosis, which is an elevation and sustainment of blood ketone levels. And, you know, we're exploring these for a wide array of different things, but maybe you can kind of share with the audience as a refresher, like that you don't need to be ketogenic to uh, the vast majority of people that that you see, I'm sure, uh, will be highly responsive to carbohydrate management or carbohydrate restriction to some extent. And uh, and then only in some situations do you have to like pull the trigger and go into a therapeutic ketosis, right? If extreme insulin resistance, ketones are inversely proportional to insulin and typically glucose too, to some extent. Uh, but you could probably so maybe explain uh, to our listeners, you know, the difference between uh, the clinical low carb and then a clinical ketogenic diet from, uh, from an implementation perspective. Sure. So low carb is just a very broad uh, category of diets. Ketogenic diets are low carb, but not all low carb diets are ketogenic. Low carb, I would say, and I'm, I'm going to be talking about this, where does low carb begin in terms of carb, your carb content? That will really depend on the person. Some people would say 20 grams of net carbohydrate. I say it could be higher for some people. 20 grams is a good starting point, but maybe 30 grams to 100 grams would be a low carb diet. You may have some low level of ketosis at that level of carb restriction, but you're not going to have very high ketones. With a ketogenic diet, a therapeutic ketogenic diet, you're going to not only have low carbohydrate intake, less than 20 grams, but also a much higher fat percentage um, that you're really looking at. And I would say moderate protein, adequate, definitely adequate, not too low, but also not a very high. Low carb, you could have high protein. You can be anywhere between moderate and high protein, anywhere between very low carb like about 30 grams up to about 100 grams of net carbs. And the fat is going to vary depending on the the proportions of protein and carbs. But a therapeutic ketogenic diet is always going to be very high in fat, very low in carbs, kind of moderate in protein. That's a good point. Like people don't realize that the four to one, three to one calculations and even the modified Atkins is kind of on a gram basis. So if you do the calculations for a four to one uh, and even a five to one, in some cases they use, I mean, you're looking at a a fat percentage uh, in the upper 80s, 80, you know, 80 percent or more of of fat. And that what what I've seen in kids and, and families that have kids, for example, with neurometabolic disorders, epilepsy. And other things like glucose transporter type one deficiency syndrome is that there's a, a fat intolerance. And then, so, you know, when I, when I started studying the ketogenic diet, I did, I got Eric Kossoff's book and did, got my scale out and weighed everything. And I was like, wow, this is a very difficult, it inspired us more to look at the potential applications of exogenous ketones or as an adjuvant to the ketogenic diet, just to make it. And, and another thing I got a little bit concerned about with that clinical ketogenic diet And I think something that I think you bring attention to, uh, which is really important, is protein. And I think uh, many people will point to the growth restriction that may have happened in some of the pediatric cases and with the ketogenic diets. And that was likely due to the protein restriction associated with uh, the four to one. Uh, And, you know, and I think more recently the the low carb group has really been focusing on prioritizing protein as the primary macronutrient for the vast array of people wanting to do quote unquote like keto diets but it's really a low carb low carb diets so maybe speak a little bit about um like your approach I, i've talked to denise potter and beth Zupak kenya and and different people who have been in it for an equal amount of time and 
and there's there's a science and also an art and every <laughs> practitioner is kind of like an artist in the way they approach their patients and i wondered if you have any kind of essential tools in your toolbox and how you go about uh formulating a ketogenic diet maybe some some uh comments you have on foods to avoid or supplements and you know measuring ketones we talked about that for your population probably not super important but would be curious to to hear about your tools and, and your approaches your unique approach sure so i have some handouts that i've created um and i've also referred people to diet doctor to look at their visual guides which you know tell you how many carbs are in different foods um but i always start with protein because i i think that protein is the most important thing that people get right. They need an adequate amount of protein. And so I, I generally will uh, talk to people about um, the amount that they should shoot for per meal. And for most people, it's going to be, I say, I would say in general, around 100 grams um, for many people, um, adults that are, you know, from like taller women and um, maybe um kind of shorter men around 100 grams of, of protein but i'm really doing it based on uh, ideal body weight or if they uh if they're at their uh or near their ideal weight then i would just use their regular weight and do about 1.2 anywhere between 1.2 to 1.8 grams per kilogram of ideal body weight and um and that's a pretty big range but it, it really depends on how many times a day they're eating and and what they like to eat and what their appetite is like. Um, but that will give them adequate protein um, to meet their yeah. needs for muscle growth um, and maintenance and, um, and you know, just their amino acid needs that we have. Yeah. So I start with protein and then I, I um, show them, you know, what does three and a half ounces of protein look like? Um, what are the different ways that you can get protein? Um, it's not just meat. Um, and uh, so I have, you know, I have lists that, uh, that, that go into protein and carbs and fat and recommend um, kind of a range for each person based on their goals. If they want to lose weight, um, I, I don't actually prescribe a calorie, um, a strict calorie level, but I say, you know, if you're going to be tracking, kind of go within a range of, um, let's say for one person, maybe between 15 and 1600, 15, 1800, something like that. Um, so I, I would say that I really individualize it based on what they want and what they like to eat. And as I said, how many times a day they're eating, that's going to make mm. a big difference in the protein portion. If they're eating only twice yeah. a day, they're going to have to eat bigger amounts. And yeah. um, that's one thing I think intermittent fasting can be really helpful for people. But if they're only eating twice a day, then they need to make sure they're getting uh, hitting their protein targets of both of those uh, meals uh, because they're not going to be able to make it up in the third meal if they really are keeping to a tight eating schedule. So um, yeah. it's, it's really individual. So when you ask me if I have any tools, I have several tools and I, it will really depend on the person. But I do talk to them about their goals, what, um, you know, how they like to eat, the types of foods they like to eat. And then we kind of make a plan so that I know that they're meeting their essential nutrition needs and also getting into, um, if, if they're on a ketogenic diet, at least mild ketosis. I don't have a lot of people test their ketones unless they really um, are doing it for a therapeutic benefit. But mm -hmm. I think that for most people, being in at least a mild ketosis can have an appetite suppressing effect. So I do recommend trying to keep the, the carbs down if, um, if they're trying to lose weight. And of course, if they're trying to control their blood sugar, generally speaking, a, a very low carb approach is going to help keep their blood sugar in better control than doing, you know, a kind of a higher carb or moderate carb diet of 70 to 100 grams. I would usually recommend a little lower. And whether it's going to be ketogenic or not will depend on the amount of fat that they're eating um, with their meals, say, or in how much protein as well, because they may be. Uh, they may be doing, you know, kind of on the higher end, about 1.8 grams per kilogram and getting, you know, a little too much protein to really be in ketosis all the time. But it's it's very individual. Some people can. Some people can eat two grams of protein per kilogram and still maintain pretty decent ketone levels. So yeah. it's it's about testing, 
um, but also seeing the effects on appetite, um, blood sugar, and just overall well-being. Yeah. And I think uh, uh, to add to that too, what I think is also important is body composition. And uh, I've been, you know, doing body scans and then DEXA and everything. And I started ketogenic diet in 2008 when my research went in that direction. And would like to add that I did back way off on my protein to like one gram per kilogram and then one to two. And I, you know, only over the last maybe a couple years did I really start adding uh, protein back in again. But my DEXA scans over the last 15 years, you know, indicated that I lost 18 pounds of lean body mass. <laughs> I, I was, I was a bit wow. heavy. I was like over, you know, 230 pounds in 2008. Uh, and, uh, but my, uh, I, I lost, you know, 18 pounds of lean body mass and my fat mass went up too. <laughs> in addition to that, but I wasn't training as much, but I, I know, I just know from experience and I just know, uh, that, that protein restriction was a major contributor to that. And also just, you know, maybe not doing as much resistance training and stuff that I did, you know, when I was younger and just, you know, as you age hormones and things like that tend to, you know, fall off. But I think that's super important for people to really, nail down their protein requirements. And I like that 1.2 to like 1.5 to 1.6 even grams per kilogram. And just to know that and then fill in the rest with, uh, and then titrate the calories with, with fat and fibrous vegetables and things like that. Um, and I've had people say that, you know, I've tried counting calories. I've tried doing that, but, but the only thing that worked for me was keto, but I, I don't think they're kind of acknowledging that a ketogenic diet, a well-formulated ketogenic diet that centralizes protein and fiber and then adjusts the fat accordingly inadvertently creates a caloric deficit. And I think that contributes in large part to, uh, you know, favorable changes in body composition, loss of fat, appetite suppression, um, and would it, it was interesting that you don't, on average, you don't try to have people track their macros or even track their calories in any way, maybe unless they're not losing weight. Is that correct? Right. And it also depends on the person. If somebody really enjoys tracking, then I do recommend it. And I think it can be helpful at the beginning sometimes to track just to know, are you actually hitting your protein goals? Um, but some people really hate tracking and they say, if I'm going to have, if I have to track, then I'm not going to do it. So yeah. I'm really open to people who want to track versus those who don't. And, um, it just really depends on the person, but yes, if they're, I think if they're struggling and they're not moving forward in their progress to lose weight, I think it can be really helpful to track because if you don't track, you might be eating more or less of something than you think you are. And, uh, and that can help you nail it down. And then you only have to track for a little bit and then you can go back to not tracking if that doesn't really suit your, your lifestyle or interests. Yeah. Yeah. You could rapidly create a caloric surplus if you just sit down on the couch at night with a bag of cashews or nuts sure. or nut butters and things like that. For me, it's really hitting a calorie amount. I usually end up at the end of the day deficient in calories. So uh, I, I use sour cream and dark chocolate, baking cocoa, a little bit of allulose and stevia. And I make like this with some wild blueberries. I make like a chocolate keto mousse blueberry thing like every single night. <laughs> so that, that I kind of fantastic. Calories <laughs> gap. I might throw in some like dark, like chocolate collagen powder or something like that just to bump up my protein. But that has been, that has saved me and that has allowed me to follow a very low carb diet, ketogenic diet and kind of maintain, stabilize my weight, I guess you could say, but otherwise the appetite suppressing effect is so great that I would just kind of keep, you know, losing weight and just not, you know, just walking in a calorie deficit and that works great. And you feel great for a while, but if you're on low calorie and sustaining that low calorie, your energy does dip, you know, and then you have a metabolic, um, uh, you know, uh, the metabolic, uh, adjustment to that is ultimately going to start slowing your metabolism. You're kind of going to feel it to some to some extent. And it's very noticeable if you like fast for seven days, you actually feel cold. And if you, if you follow a protracted calorie deficit diet to sort of drop your body weight or to get in shape for something or to lose body fat, um, and people who have done this can, you know, will tell you, or anyone who has yo-yo dieted will tell you that, you know, you feel kind of great in the beginning and then it gets very tough. And then you just start feeling the fatigue 
with sustained calorie restriction over time. So it's not, you have to do it uh, in a very nuanced way <laughs> yeah, and titrate it to your energy levels too. Absolutely. So, I was wondering uh, in regards to med- cardio metabolic health biomarkers, one of the things that we've covered uh, a lot at the metabolic health summit and many people that we interview uh, is sort of this generic blood work that people should be doing when you start a diet. Uh, and is that something that you have people do, uh, do you request people have like baseline, uh, comprehensive metabolic panel or CBC just to see where they're at, because you could see some pretty big changes in blood work. Uh, yeah, I didn't see huge changes, but I definitely did see changes and some of them were alarming to my doctor and they made some suggestions for, pharmaceutical management of certain <laughs> biomarkers. So I wondered how you approach that and if you advise people to get uh, labs done before you work with them. Do you love learning about metabolic health? So do we. It's why we created the Metabolic Initiative, an online educational platform providing evidence-based education on metabolic health and therapies for healthcare professionals and the general public. By joining the Metabolic Initiative, you'll gain access to hundreds of expert lectures, interviews, panel discussions, and even private episodes of the Metabolic Link. CMEs are available. Go to metabolicinitiative.com to get started. And as always, thank you for listening to the Metabolic Link. Yeah, I always want to see labs before I start working with somebody. And a complete metabolic um, panel is a minimum. Um, I'd like to see other things. I do like to see an A1C. Um, and I like to have a lipid prep um, panel. And as well, I would like to have like an advanced um, marker so that you have the LDL particles or the ApoB um, because that will change in some people. Some people, it's very favorable. A lot of people with metabolic syndrome actually see those numbers improve. Their HDL, you know, improves, goes up. Um, their LDL doesn't change much or it goes down. Um, and, and triglycerides go down almost always. Um, but I would say the lean, the leaner types tend to um, see that higher ApoB or LDL particles. Um, I haven't had too many people who've had a dramatic experience. I actually had one myself back in 2014 um, that was pretty dramatic. And that was before, um, you know, Jay Feldman or anyone was talking about lean mass hyper responders. Um, so it, I, I do have that myself. Um, and I do like to, to see where people are at baseline. Um, just so, you know, if they do have a doctor that is concerned, um, and, and if the patient is concerned as well, we can, uh, do a few things, try a few things that, you know, before we, they even talk about doing anything with a statin or pharmaceuticals, um, such Mm -hmm. as, you know, maybe boosting fiber a bit if they're not doing a lot of fiber, um, um, possibly cutting back on some dairy fats, um, if they're willing to do that. <laughs> it can be hard too, especially if people have had really good results on a ketogenic diet and the foods that they're eating have done so many wonderful things for them. And then um, their doctor's telling them no butter, no cheese. Um, that can be tough. But I say just cut back a little bit and see if it helps. It may not help. Um, but that's something actually I found was helpful for myself is to cut back a bit on some of those. And, um, and that's what I recommend. But um, I'm also there are patients who are not that concerned about those numbers, or they're uh, so happy with the improvements in their blood sugar, their blood pressure, their weight, and how they feel overall that they're, um, they're willing to see if that kind of evens out over time, which it often does too, is sometimes temporary at the beginning, um, to see that elevation in ApoB or LDL particles and LDL cholesterol. Yeah. You have to look at everything in context and how the person feels and just, you know, the hazard ratio for other things that, uh, were elevated that improved like blood pressure for one thing, hemoglobin, A1C, insulin, HSCRP, things like that, which often improved pretty dramatically. But yeah, I mean, my ApoB at one point was 165 and now it's maybe like 120, uh, and simply just, you know, titrating back the fat a little bit and adding more protein, which I did, which is, I think, stabilize my lean body mass and, uh, adding fiber back in, uh, not back in, I mean, just increasing it to some extent. And if I'm not in ketosis, uh, by definition, just by adding, not having a ketogenic macronutrient ratio using, uh, fats like MCT oil or, uh, electrolyte 
uh, beta hydroxybutyrate salts or things like that, which also give electrolytes, which can be helpful on a ketogenic diet uh, or low carb diet. So, uh, yeah, do you do you find the need for supplements in the form of carnitine, uh, electrolytes, uh, vitamin D, um, things like that, selenium? Is that something that you test for? Do you use do you do nutrient testing and uh, do you find that most patients require supplementation? Um, for the carnitine, I haven't had any patients who follow such a strict ketogenic diet where I've tested it or have seen any problems. I know that Beth and Denise do test mm -hmm. carnitine. They want a, a baseline carnitine. I haven't done that yet. Um, if somebody wants to do a very strict therapeutic ketogenic diet, I would uh, test their carnitine and then test it again, you know, so we have a baseline and can see if they need supplementation. Um, vitamin D, I, that's another thing that I always like to look at. And then I find that most people need it, even, you know, even I in Florida, and I think you mentioned before that you have to take it too, it. Um, yeah. quite a bit. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, so many people are deficient and some doctors, more doctors now are testing it than used to. Um, even, you know, just uh, doctors who aren't necessarily into integrative health, they're testing vitamin D because I think there's enough research showing that um, it's, it's very important. It's a hormone and we need it and many people are deficient. So I, I do always want to see a vitamin D and then I do recommend supplementing um, vitamin D if they're low. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you, you mentioned selenium. I don't usually test selenium. Um, if they're eating enough nuts and fish, they should be fine. I kind of look at the diet and then I say, you know, maybe test, we'll, we'll test this if I think somebody might be low. As far as electrolytes though, definitely, you know, um, making sure they're getting enough sodium um, at, at least at the beginning um, to prevent ketogenic flu symptoms. And then also magnesium, potassium are really important. But again, if you're following a, a well-balanced, uh, I would say omnivorous, a ketogenic diet, then you're going to be getting plenty of magnesium and potassium and things like leafy greens, fish, avocado, nuts, seeds, meat. Um, yeah. So those usually don't require, I would say sometimes magnesium does. Um, if people are getting yeah. muscle cramps, sometimes they'll need to supplement with magnesium. Um, but otherwise, if you're, if you're eating enough food and you're eating the right food, you, you probably don't need a supplement or if you do, maybe just temporarily. Yeah. I, I did experience quite a few, uh, calf cramps at night. It always would happen at like two or three in the morning. And I think it was correlated just with like a sleep cycle, like your serotonin drops. And I think you have some, you know, muscle changes, uh, the, the nervous system is interacting with muscles in some way where it's, it's triggering that. But since I moderated my dietary approach to be a little bit less ketogenic and just more low carb and, uh, and maybe adding just more vegetables. And I also use, I use a powder called calm, you know, at night, mm -hmm. uh, magnesium. And then, uh, maybe a couple times a week, I'll take magnesium three and eight, uh, that I get from life extension. And, uh, I think they have a pretty good product and then, um, and then bio optimizers makes a magnesium ultra magnesium or something with all the different forms of magnesium. And that has helped. And I, I do track magnesium and blood work. And now it's like at the high end of normal and, but it was at the low end of normal and below optimal range, maybe back in 2011 or 12 when I first measured it. So that has been something that I just, you know, and by definite, I, even on chronometer or my fitness pal, when I put in all my foods, my magnesium was like off the charts. It was pretty high, uh, but it was, I was still deficient. The same thing with vitamin D and, you know, my dermatologist said, you, you got to get out of the sun. You're in the sun way too much. So I'm always like, almost like overly tan. So I mean, we live on a farm or, you know, in Southern Florida, as you know, you get a lot of sun, yeah. but my, uh, vitamin D was the low end of normal. So my doctor advised to go on prescription vitamin D, which, uh, so now I just buy the, you know, generic form and just take it once or twice a week, I think. And yeah, my levels have been, you know, uh, much better. So, uh, a lot of people kind of hesitate when it comes to restrictive carb restriction or ketogenic diets in particular therapeutically, uh, because they have a hard time navigating, uh, dietary choices when they travel or when they go out to eat or when they're visiting a friend. And do you have any tips for people, uh, when they do go out to eat? I mean, we have friends that they just 
they don't eat at home at all. They go out to eat all the time and they're like, they say, oh, I could never do a ketogenic diet because I always found this strange because you can always, uh, you can always get by. <laughs> and I just wanted to know, like, what do you say to your clients and, and, and your education outreach when you talk about navigating low carb and ketogenic diets when you travel or eat out? Yeah. Well, I say you can definitely get a low carb or keto meal at just about any restaurant. There are a couple of exceptions, <laughs> maybe like a fried, but even then, I was going to say like a fried fish and chips place. Even then, you can peel the batter off the fish. I've done it. Um, same thing with like a fried chicken place. I have done it. You can do that. It's not ideal, but it's a way to actually still stay um, low carb or keto when you travel. But at pretty much any other restaurant, you can do it, you know, whatever type of food that you like to eat. And starting with breakfast, an omelet or bacon and eggs, you can get that at any restaurant. And, and you, you just say no toast and no uh, hash browns and um, anything else that might come with it that's carby. Um, but for meals, I think big salads are great. I know not everyone loves salads, but I do. Like a cob salad with um, you know every, all of those things on it, you've got a perfect ketogenic or low carb meal there. Same thing with a chicken Caesar salad without the croutons or a chef salad. Um, then of course there's just plain meat or fish and vegetables that you can always do. You know, if you want it to higher fat, you can ask the waiter to bring some extra butter. Um, and you know, that's a, at any steakhouse, but at an Italian place, yeah. you can do a caprese salad. I mean, I could go on and on. So I do have sometimes my clients when they say they're going out to eat and they're not sure what they're, they can eat at this restaurant. Oh, I don't think there's anything. I say, send me the menu. Please send me the menu and I will find something on there or something that you can modify because you can always do it. And same thing when you're traveling and you're, if you're at someone else's house, that can be tricky. Sometimes you don't want to insult anyone. Um, but I would still try to find out what they're serving, um, for dinner. And usually though, I, I you know, I've actually never gotten into trouble. I just leave whatever is not, um, uh, you know, that I wouldn't eat. So the potatoes, the bread, um, I mean, if they serve you lasagna, then um, that's that's tricky because that's a mixed dish. But almost anything else you can eat around and um, just explain. I would say explain to your hostess, um, you know, that you follow a very special diet for health reasons, um, because a lot of people think diet is just a weight loss thing. And you can, you know, you can go off of it for a day or an evening. Um, and for some people, it, it could actually cause cravings. It could cause uh, increase their blood sugar. It could do a lot of things when you're not used to eating carbs to all of a sudden introduce a bunch of carbs into your body. So I, yeah. I think that um, I would explain to a hostess if I was going to someone's home, but for eating out or eating on vacation, there, you can always do it. And it just takes sometimes a little bit of practice um, to ordering um, things a little differently, asking for things without a bun or without a, a sauce. So there you go, everybody. So that's the, the Red Food Dietitian <laughs> is telling you that there's no excuses out there. Uh, yeah, I was going to mention the Cobb salad. I, I frequently get that when we go out. I think we got it the last time we went out this weekend. And uh, I, you know, uh, Cobb salad, double chicken, I think is what I got and, and dressing on the side or olive oil and vinegar on the side. And uh, they always give the salad to my wife. I was like, no, I'm good because she usually orders something like more normal. <laughs> But, uh, but yeah, you can even like fast food places like McDonald's offer salad. I mean, yeah, it's just, there's exactly. really no excuse. You can always navigate. And I, I was going to give a plug for Chipotle as well, because yep. you can do a salad there with whatever meat you want, carnitas or the beef or chicken, and then just use the guacamole as your dressing. It, it works so well. And because they give you a very generous amount of it and you can put sour cream on if you want as well and cheese, but just the, the lettuce, the the fajita vegetables and the meat and the guac um, is great. And it's a perfect meal and uh, it's filling. That's, that's the other thing. It's, it's very filling. You don't feel that you've missed anything when you have a, a salad at, um, at Chipotle. I don't think, I think you get all the flavors. Yep. Well, another, I mean, talking about, you know, uh, foods that are indulgent and kind of navigating not only the restaurant, but also the grocery store. Right. So, 
my students have done research in cell-based assays on non-nutritive sweeteners. That includes saccharin, uh, you know, aspartame, uh, sucralose, uh, and other sweeteners, you know, on the growth and proliferation of cancer cells and, and, you know, just doing, we're doing different experiments now. And also, uh, not non-nutritive sweeteners, but uh, sugar alternatives. And I've been very interested in allulose and I've been testing a few products. Uh, RX Sugar makes some kind of cool products and some bars that I'm testing now. And I have been, I've been kind of resistant about the use of artificial sweet. I do use a pinch of stevia and monk fruit, like in my uh, coffee and things like that. But uh, I've been very impressed with the CGM data and also the publications on allulose and I wondered about your opinion about allulose. So I have a couple papers I was reading, you know, it's a GLP one agonist, it's a calorie restriction mimetic and, uh, and, and actually it actually favorably influences the microbiome increasing acromancia, I think, which is like a, a mucus, uh, generating, uh, bug that helps, you know, the, the, um, that helps reduce intestinal permeability and just the general health of your intestinal mucosa. So these are, it's almost like a functional food, almost too good to be true. Uh, although I do get some bloating, I think if I get more than like, you know, 20 grams in one dose on an empty stomach kind of deal. But uh, when you're working with someone or even in the, the education outreach that you do, and it's kind of a, a triggering topic for some people, what is your advice on non-nutritive sweeteners or, or sugar alternatives? Okay, yes, one of the most controversial topics um, out yeah. there. <laughs> and uh, I um, I used sugar substitutes and, and have for many years before I was even uh, low carb or keto. But I understand that some people don't want to and I completely respect that. So I talk to um, my clients to see how they feel about them. Um, I do prefer things like stevia, erythritol, allulose, um, and those kinds of sweeteners. Um, you made some great points about allulose, and I was gonna say, it's great. It is kind of self-limiting though, because if you have too much, you can get a stomach ache, you can get mm -hmm. um, some digestive upset, but I think you don't need a lot. It tastes so much like sugar, and it's as sweet as sugar. It's a little sweeter than erythritol. So yeah. it's, um, it's I, I'm really a fan of all of them in small amounts if people want to use them. And if people find that even those sweeteners trigger cravings or problems, then we absolutely don't need them in our diet. Um, it's, it's very individual. So I'm, I'm really open and, um, and I understand and respect everyone's position on them. And, and as I said, I use them. So I would never tell others not to use them because I use them myself and they don't cause problems for me, but I'm very aware that they do cause problems for some other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, the data would indicate that, um, you know, that uh, aspartame does not affect insulin, the aspartame doesn't really affect glucose at all. But my wife, I forget if it's, you know, Coke Zero or Di one of the Cokes, uh, if she drinks it, and she starts to get shaky, and we measured her blood glucose, and there's a sharp drop in her glucose. And that's either due to a release of insulin or something else is going on there. I don't have that reaction, but I can say without a shred of a doubt that some people may have uh, an insulin response and then that could trigger, you know, hunger after the post, you know, if, if you go a little bit hypoglycemic. So uh, some of the emerging data on allulose is interesting, especially if it works through GLP-1 as potentially as an appetite suppressant and, and also changing, I think in a favorable way, the gut microbiome. So, uh, so that's on our list of things that we want to study. And, uh, um, thank you for your, your, your opinion on that. And, uh, I, I, I think, I think there's a big opportunity here to replace many of the sugar sweetened beverages and foods out there with something like allulose. And I think that that could be the future. It could be a game changer and, you know, people don't want to be uh, restrictive. And, and when you change the whole, you know, if, if you talk to a family and a child has to go on a ketogenic diet and you clean out all the cupboards and everything, that radical shift can cause a lot of trauma to the family mm -hmm. and their eating choices. And, uh, and I guess that's another, and I, I navigate this, you know, with different families and even my own family, I think, and, or parents, it's like, 
maybe start small, right? And then work your way into it. When you start working with a person, I, I would imagine that you have to change the eating behavior of the entire family, right? And it, does that conversation come up? And how do you broach the subject of kind of getting the whole family on board? And do you just eliminate all the sugar in the house or do you start slow and work it in? Yeah, again, this is pretty individual. I would say when working with a family, when if it's a child, then everyone does the diet together, which makes it really easy. But if it's an adult and it's a, um, a woman and her husband doesn't necessarily want to eat a low carb diet, um, and, maybe, and maybe they'll change their mind later, but um, I do recommend getting rid of any trigger foods, any sugar junk that you know you may um, on a stressful day want to dig into, trying to get that out of the house or at least hidden from your sight if your husband or, or somebody else in the home says that they can't live without it and they're not gonna get rid of it no matter what diet you're doing. So I think it's just um, getting some cooperation from people in your home if you're not, if they're not willing to do the diet with you so that they're at least uh, somewhat supportive of what you're doing. And, um, but it's ideal if everyone can do the diet together because it certainly makes it a lot easier to cook and, um, and that's what I prefer, but it's just not always possible. And then what you'll do is you'll cook, uh, you know, like meat and vegetables and then just cook whatever they want on the side, potatoes or rice or whatever it is, the carbs that they want for the rest of the family if they're not doing the diet with you. Um, but yeah, I say nobody really needs the, the sugary junk. So uh, unless someone is absolutely adamant that they must have it um, in the house, get rid of it. And if someone's going to keep it there, make sure it's hidden from you so that you don't have to see it and be tempted by it if that's the sort of thing that tempts you. Yeah. Great advice. Well, as you're moving forward, like and into the future, kind of uh, what are things that you're excited about in regards to the education outreach that you're doing? And I know you're you're pretty active on social and the YouTube and, and the blogs and things like that. So maybe you could tell people uh, currently what you're working on, what you're most excited about and how they can connect with you. Sure. Well, I'm really excited about Metabolic Mind. Um, I just, as I said, just started writing for them um, a little while ago, but I think they've got some huge plans to continue the outreach, to continue to grow and fund a lot of research. I'm really excited about that research in metabolic psychiatry um, and uh, and also just continuing to see the support. Um, so many doctors coming to low carb and ketogenic diets for diabetes um, remission and pre-diabetes remission. Um, it just um, there's more and more. What's great is once the once doctors and other clinicians see what this diet can do, they don't go back. It's not you know it's not something that they try for a while. They see how well it works, and I'm just I want to do everything I can to support people who are interested in going into this field and working in ketogenic therapies. Um, yeah, I think it's just such an exciting time, and uh, I'm really looking forward to it. And I love what you're doing with the a metabolic initiative where you're doing, um, uh, you know, so much uh, training and research for people to support clinicians who uh, want to do this with their patients. And um, really, we can all help change the world together. And it's, it's very exciting. Yeah, well, I have to say, Francisca, you were one of the inspirations for that, because, you know, as scientists, we stay in the lab, but we realize that uh, when you do research on dietary interventions like this, you realize that a lot of the research findings are very actionable and where the rubber meets the road is, you know, you have to have practitioners out there that are uh, advancing the science into application and, and helping people actually implement these approaches. And on the surface, they seem very simple <laughs> scientifically with the macronutrient ratios, but in practice, there is truly like uh, the science, but also really the art of doing this in resonating, you know, having ideas on, on how to implement this and, and doing a more nuanced approach and a personalized approach uh, for individuals, depending on, you know, what health uh, challenges that they're facing. So I want to thank you for doing what you do on the education outreach front and for being part of the Metabolic Health uh, Summit community and being, you know, helping us and being a speaker and uh, lending your expertise to the community and also here at the podcast, the Metabolic Link podcast. So, and I want to Thank you again for your time for, you know, we're about up on time now, but I want to thank you for 
uh, thank everybody for tuning in to the Metabolic Link podcast. And I really want to thank Francisca for lending her expertise and her uh, nutritional wisdom here. And uh, we're really excited to have her part of the community. And I'm super excited uh, to, to share this. And once it comes out, I think we'll share it with our community. And I know this is the type of content. Uh, there are a lot of people that are basic science researchers and clinicians that follow our content, but the vast majority of people who follow what we do really are seeking implementation advice, you know, just simple advice on how I can get benefits from this approach. <laughs> and I think that's exactly what you're off offering. And I thank you so much for lending your, your time today for sharing your wisdom with us. Oh, thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. And I cannot wait to be a speaker at Metabolic Health Summit. So looking forward to it and very, very honored that I was asked to present. So thank you so much. And thank you for the great work that you, Angela and Victoria are doing. Thank you, Francisca. And people out there, when you're listening, uh, if you're listening, if you've enjoyed this podcast, please share it, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Uh, please follow us and leave us a comment or review. It really helps us advance this and reach more people. And we hope you all enjoy it. Join us next time. Thank you.